And good afternoon and welcome back to the Over 40s Fitness Podcast. My name's Tristan Lowe and here we are late February 2024 and today I'm going to be discussing the 10 things I need to be a personal trainer, okay? I've been a professional personal trainer for over 15 years now and once in a while I remind myself of a handful, in, in, this, uh, in today's case, 10 things we need to be a personal trainer. Now, uh, I'd like to, at the fir- very first, um, dispel any myths about what a, uh, a personal trainer is. A personal trainer is not a, a counsellor, a therapist, a psychiatrist or a psychotherapist or a doctor or a GP. Uh, we're not barbers or hairdressers or stylists. Um, we hear all kinds of um, uh, descriptions. We're not uh, shoulders for people to cry on. We're a multitude of things, but first and foremost, we're service providers. We provide a service. Okay, now, um, I'm just going to mention, uh, talk about a passage in a study book from mine, and it it goes through a couple of things that a personal trainer, uh, who we work alongside uh, with our clients, exclusive of the client. Okay, so here's here's a little graph here, and for those of you watching on YouTube, and we work alongside uh, doctors, and when we say doctors, a GP, physiotherapists, uh, nutritionists, uh, holistic therapists, massage therapists, and in some cases, dietitians and stress counsellors. Now, um, uh, I've, got a, uh, I've got a list that I put in my little black book here, just to remind me once in a while, and it can change, you know, there's no, there's no reason why in the future my list of 10 things doesn't change, but for now, 15 years into my profession um, and uh, still learning, here's the 10 things that I need to be. And if you'd like to be a personal trainer as well, these are some things you need to take into account. Okay, Uh, in no particular order, but here we go, the 10 things. Right, Um, you need a genuine uh, genuine, uh, interest in health or health and fitness in whichever order, okay? If you're not, if you don't have a genuine interest uh, in health, uh, in fitness, it's going to be very hard uh, to not not so much become a personal trainer because you can wing it for a while, but it's going to be very hard to be consistent uh, and have some sort some sort of uh, high level quality service, you know, or a career. Um, there will be occasions where someone doesn't generally have. I've heard about footballers, professional footballers, who don't read about football. They don't watch video games on football. They don't watch games that have been recorded. I've heard about it with professional footballers in the Premier League, and that must exist throughout other professions where people have no interest in what they do on or off the pitch or out of the office. And I understand that, but as a personal trainer, you cannot afford to do that morally, ethically, uh, health-wise or financially. So if you never actually went and uh, qualified and stopped your studies halfway through, you should still have an interest, excuse me, you should still have an interest um, in health and fitness. Okay, so number one, a genuine interest in health and fitness. Number two is a qualification, okay? If you're gonna take payment from a client, um, whether it be a penny or a pound, a dollar or a dime, for those of you in North America, you should have a qualification. And they ordinarily come in two stroke three guises. The first one would be a um, a degree uh, in uh, some form of anatomy and physiology. Uh, It could be sports science degree, sports therapy degree, um, or that you've done at university. It could be a diploma. You've gone to a private diploma school and studied specifically to become a personal trainer. Um, Or you could do a a module of different courses. You know, a physiotherapist could actually give uh, his or her patient uh, exercises, which technically they are trained them in. If they actually describe them and show them the exercises, it's personal because they're with one on one to one and they train them. A chiropractor could give uh, their patient um, some exercises to strengthen their back. Um, and again, it's personal because it's private and they're giving it. So essentially, a personal trainer doesn't have to be someone um, who's just qualified as a personal trainer. It could be someone who's qualified in, in sports science, anatomy and physiology, or another one of those um, uh, careers I just mentioned who gives exercise um, to a client or a patient. Uh, now bear in mind, when you're a personal trainer, it's a client, it's not a patient. Patients are for GPs, physiotherapists uh, and doctors. Okay, so um, a qualification. So I would say go and do a degree, go and do a diploma, or go and do a multitude of modules in sports science or, excuse me, uh, education, anatomy, physiology and exercise to give you at least a a step on the ladder to get yourself into gainful employment. Number three, 
uh, I would say, um, is uh, time. You've got to have time. You have to have time to think about your when you study. You have to have time to revise, time to do your qualifications. Then go and have time to go and do your first uh, paid paid a job. That could be an apprenticeship of some description, or it could be you could walk straight into one of these huge health clubs that you see across the UK, Europe, and North America. So I would suggest that you give yourself time because you're not going to get rich overnight. Unlikely. Even if you had a celebrity client, it's not guaranteed. So you've got to say to yourself, anything between one to three years, you could be on uh, a low income uh, at best. Um, so you've got to actually put the time in. When I say time as well, uh, we have to say to ourselves, well, we can't work uh, ordinarily. We can't work nine to five like an office job. We could do if we choose to, but we'd be limiting our time uh, that we can actually um, uh, give to our clients. So it could be as a trainer any time between. I've heard of cases of trainers taking on people and training them at five o'clock in the morning. Uh, well, good luck with that. If you only work from five o'clock in the morning till midday, and that's your shift, it messes up your body's natural clock, but it's something you can work to. I myself, I take my first appointments at eight o'clock in the morning and last appointment at uh, six, sometimes seven o'clock at night. Um, so you've got to be prepared to put that time in and do anything between a 10, 12 hour day, all right? And then of course you need time to recover and repair and spend time at home, you know, with your family and friends and on your own, on, you know, time on your own, where you're not giving away your effort, energy, you know, it's literally time to, to sleep well, eat well, rest well, you know, Netflix and chill, put your feet up. All right, so time. Uh, empathy, all right? Now that's something that doesn't come uh, natural to everyone. Uh, I think we've all got it in us to some degree, some more than others, but if anything, it should grow on you. Uh, not to a point when you, uh, you need a box of tissues for yourself every time a client comes in uh, with a you know, veritable horror story or this uh, list of um, uh, unfortunate events, but you need some sort of empathy. You need to be able to uh, uh, work with a client and understand at the very least the fundamentals of why he or she um, has uh, put themselves in a poor physiological state and uh, the slippery slope that they're gonna go down if they don't do anything about it. Now that empathy um, may come in the, in the, in the, in the guise of um, articulating with a client, listening to them, understanding what they're telling us or looking for signs, body language. I've actually studied body language and I'm still studying it now, but I've officially studied it as well. And it's interesting what I learned when I studied uh, body language, some of the giveaways, the tells, I've actually seen almost, you know, for want of a better word, verbatim, I've, I've actually seen a client show me, tell me one thing, but show me something else. Okay, they can tell me that it's a, that they're going to do something, but they show me the exact opposite. It doesn't mean to say it's a bad client. It means to say that I'm getting better in looking for the signs and picking up the signs. Okay, uh, not going to master it, but what I can do is get better. So a degree of empathy, understand someone's emotions, understand um, uh, their, their thoughts, opinions, and, and be there to answer in the best of our abilities. But equally, what's important, we'll put sympathy um, with empathy. Yes, they, they're listed as slightly different, but you know, sometimes I've got that much sympathy for a client. If a client chooses uh, to live on junk food, high processed food, smoke, alcohol, you know, uh, you know, uh, online gambling, and do anything to damage their own lives and the lives of their friends, family, colleagues, works, uh, and loved ones, then there's only so much sympathy I've got. That's going to run out pretty quickly. All right? Okay. And sometimes I'll give it to a client in black and white because that might be what the client actually needs instead of feathering things up and making it soft. But generally, there's a degree of sympathy, but it can soon drop uh, if a client is telling me and showing me that they're going to do the exact opposite of what we've suggested. Okay, They are paying us for our knowledge and experience, probably more so for our experience yeah, with other clients. So it's, it's incumbent upon the client to at least, at the very least, um, be honest with themselves so we can work together and improve their physiological state. All right, and, uh, sympathy. Uh, emotional intelligence, not the same as ac academic intelligence, okay? I've trained uh, myself, I've been fortunate enough to train, I've trained dentists, doctors, anaesthetists, uh, GPs, excuse me, I've trained consultants, surgeons, and these are people with um, degrees of um, emotional intelligence that they've not bought or studied for, they've actually got it from experience. They've got it from uh, experience, time working with patients, uh, and of course age, you know, so, uh, emotional intelligence, um, the ability to actually rein ourselves in as well, not just emotional intelligence uh, to, to work with a client, but uh, to, 
to understand what is going to work for us as the trainer and know when to say yes, know when to say no, uh, and know when to say nothing. All right, so emotional intelligence as well. You may have your own description of it, but I've learned that um, sometimes it's, uh, it's good to say nothing rather than have an opinion on something. Okay, and that can always improve for myself. All right, okay. Um, the next one is control. All right, now, uh, I've learned that it is perfectly okay, or ordinarily okay, excuse me, to be in control as the trainer. Because if you're not in control, that means somebody else is. And if we leave a client to his or her, her own devices all the time and leave them uh, in control, then it's highly likely, you know, the, it's a high prob probability that the client will resort back to, back to type and go back to, you know, missing exercise, um, sleeping poorly, you know, consuming bad food and wasting their time on uh, things that don't make them healthy, things that make them unhealthy. So I would say, um, don't be fooled by anyone uh, or don't be as a trainer. Once you've got your time, effort and experience in, once you've got, you know, numbers on the board, don't be, um, don't be afraid or embarrassed or nervous or worried to make it clear that you're in control. Yes, you're working with a client, but you're in control. If a client wants you to train them, I had a client not long ago, um, asked me to train him at uh, five, no, at 6 a.m. And I said, no, at 6 a.m., I'm still asleep in bed. I get out of bed about quarter past six, half past six. Um, and, um, and the client said, okay, well, what's the earliest what you, you, you'll train me? And I said, 8 a.m. I'll open the doors at five to eight, 10 to eight, whatever it is, and you'll be the first client through the door in a 12-hour day at 8 a.m. You'll be on that treadmill or on that bike, warming up or stretching out at that time. And... Uh, Pretty soon, the client um, came back to me and said it didn't work for him because he wanted to train at, I think it was 5.45 or 6 a.m., something like that. So the client went elsewhere. Uh, what, I, what I could have done is say to the client, oh, you know what I'll do? I'll get out of bed an hour and a half, two hours earlier, and I'll train you at 5.45 at 6 a.m. But actually, that didn't work for me. I was in control. The client took over control because the client decided to go and train elsewhere. Uh, with someone that was going to train at 6 a.m. And absolutely fine. That's what's right for the client, okay? Um, even if the client offered to pay me double the hour, if the client uh, if, if said, look, Tristan, I'll pay you £90 an hour to get out of bed an hour and a half early, first thing in the day, and tra I'd still say no. You know, the money's not that important to me. It's important, but it's not that important. I was in control, and I respectfully declined opening up my business an hour and a half early, or whatever it was, okay, or two hours early, excuse me. So it's okay to be in control. Now, that doesn't mean to say be controlling because I don't think they're the same thing. Um, being controlling is not the same as being in control of yourself and a situation. I've had them in the past, in my 15 years of, uh, of working with people, where I've, I've relinquished a bit of control. I've not lost control, but relinquished some control, consciously or subconsciously. And once in a blue moon, it works out, but invariably it doesn't. Remember, as a trainer, if you're not in control, then somebody else is. And ordinarily, that leads to, um, I wouldn't say disaster, that leads to uh, disappointment. All right, so be in control. It's absolutely fine, yeah? Okay, uh, next one, a willingness to learn. All right, this is number, number eight, uh, a willingness to learn. Now, um, yes, okay, always learn. We should always be learning officially or unofficially. That would be reading books, watching something, uh, taking information, going on doing courses, modules, listening to a lecturer. But actually what I've found is a willingness to learn from a client about something that is not totally, re totally related to health and fitness. I've learned just as much from clients that I've trained about subjects that I'd have no idea about, that I would never have known or understood. Okay, so a willingness to learn. And that doesn't mean to say, okay, you know, the muscles of the shoulder are always going to be called um, the muscles in the shoulder, okay, the deltoid area. Uh, the femur bone, the thigh bone, the femur, okay, it's always going to be called uh, the femur or the thigh bone, yeah, okay. And once, you can't uninvent it and call it something else just because, just because you feel like it. You know, it may be called something else in a different language, but anatomy and physiology will always stay the same. You know, our bodies can slightly change as we age, you know, um, in terms of our body's um, shape and size. But once the anatomy is already there, okay, we can still learn about it and learn different ways to train people, what does work, what doesn't work, what worked with one client might not necessarily work with another. But I have found that actually a willingness to learn about other subjects 
Again, it could be anything from gardening, engineering, politics. I normally stay out of that. Um, uh, finance, you know, geography, travel, um, other people's relationships with their husbands, wives, girlfriends, boyfriends, mum, dad, uncle, brother, whatever. Okay, and it's actually something that's quite good. Um, it can give us trainers a more, um, I wouldn't say qualified, I'd say uh, broader scope to work with a client, an old, an old uh, 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 a returning client, a current client, or a uh, prospective. So a willingness to learn. Um, because if you, as a personal trainer, I can tell you now, you, are, you will be, as long as you work with a varied range of people, you are in a fantastic position, you know, to actually understand and learn about, sometimes in detail, about other people's professions or other people's lives because you've got their attention and they've got your attention for one hour a week or two hours a week, you know, and, and trust me, you don't stand there for one hour with your arms folded with a cup of tea or if you're a young man, a protein drink in your hand watching someone else run on a treadmill. If that's the case, you may as well become a cleaner or a gym instructor. Nothing wrong with those professions. Okay, so um, a willingness to learn. Learn about something other then health, fitness, anatomy, and physiology, um, and nutrition, okay? Uh, what was the film? The Shining, Jack Nicholson. Um, I think in it, there was a famous phrase in it. It went something like, all work and no play makes Jack a dull boy. I think it was Jack Nicholson in The Shining. Correct me if I'm wrong. Any uh, movie enthusiasts out there, all work and no play makes Jack a dull boy. You have to actually spend some time learning about different things. So a willingness to learn. Yeah, only a week ago, I went on a short half-day module on stress management, um, and it was for me to actually sort of look at someone, listen to someone else's uh, opinions, thoughts, and experience and professional um, education in a short, I think it was about two, three-hour lecture in Lincoln on stress management. And yeah, it was an interesting one. I learned something about it, okay? Uh, and that might actually help myself with regards to stress management. Ordinarily, I wouldn't say I'm stressed out. I might have a stressful moment, hour, minute, day, but ordinarily... Don't suffer too much, okay? And when I do, I try and course correct quick, quickly. So a willingness to learn, go and do another course on a subject matter. But more important than anything else, listen to your clients and ask, probe your clients for questions. You know, if it's a little old lady and she knits in her spare time for her grandchildren, ask her something, you know. Is it merino wool? Is it a wool mix? You know, how long is one of those big needle things? I don't know, okay? And you might not care. But you may have a next client could be a, you know, a ex rugby player, you know, twenty five stone monster, and ask him about, you know, how much calories he was eating in his uh, in his prime. And your next client could be a thirty nine year old mother of two, and uh, she's just had her second child eight months ago, and she's looking to actually um, lose some weight and get fit again, make herself feel good again. Ask her, ask her how it's going. You know what it's like to be a mother of two, a new mother of two. Ask her what it's like to juggle her time and her body and her efforts and her, with her family. Learn something about other people and what they do. I, I find other people's cultures and uh, interests and professions very interesting. Um, so, all right, we're in this to learn. Number nine, nearly there, folks. We're gonna try and wrap this up in 20 minutes and we're currently on 18 and a half. Number nine, uh, I think that, that a personal trainer needs to have is consistency, yeah? In the same way that our clients need to have a degree of consistency with their training, with their nutrition, with their sleep, with their diet, with their supplementation, with their uh, self-care. We have to have consistency as a trainer. It's very hard um, to be consistently good all the time, every day, all the time. I'm not, and I'd like to meet someone that is. If they are, hey, you can come and train me. I'll give you my hard-earned time, effort, and money. Um, I've yet to meet any client of any description that is 100% consistent, uh, and by extension, our trainers um, uh, can't be 100% consistent all the time. And if you come across a trainer or a physiotherapist or a doctor or a psychiatrist or a whatever who, who tells you with a straight face that they are 100% consistent every minute of every day, 52 weeks a year, I'm not going to say they're lying. I'm saying they're being economical with the truth or they've got a short memory. Okay, It's not physically, humanly possible to be consistent every minute, every time. What is possible is to be consistent most of the time. And that means getting up, have your cold shower, if you're like me, have your hot shower, if, uh, if that's what you need. Brush your teeth, have your breakfast and go to work. Okay, if you're badly injured or you're badly ill, then you need to rest and recover. And your, your clients will thank you for that. 
So remember, if you're injured or ill and you need to rest and take a day off, do it. And then, fortunately, I don't have too many myself. I might take two hours here, three hours there, one hour here. That keeps me uh, ticking over until I take myself to take a break once, maybe twice a year. Consistency as well. You know, be consistent with following up clients, you know, with a phone call, an email, a text message, something like that. Try and stay on top of things because they'll catch up with you otherwise. Uh, I've learned sometimes the easy way and the hard way, be, be consistent with your booking system. I'm on my third booking system at the moment now. I'm still learning how to work a new one, but always be consistent. Be transparent with your consistency. Say to a client, look, look, John, my apologies, I've made a booking error. Can you come in another day, another time? But be clear first. Tell them you've made a booking error, okay? Um, and nine times out of 10, a client's fine with that. Um, so when I say consistency as well, um, that means uh, always w w what your culture and your ethics and your morals are, right down to cross to the, the important part, your prices, be consistent. If you charge a client a pound an hour, stick to a pound an hour. Inform them when you're gonna change the price or you're gonna up it or you're gonna decrease it but be consistent once you've made that decision, okay? And your clients will thank you for it. Inconsistency uh, leads to a breakdown of some description, okay? And finally, uh, number 10, I think it's number 10, what we need as a personal trainer is availability, okay? Um, I've not put this one tenth because it's the most important one, anything like that, but it's very important. I could have all of those things from number one to number nine, quick recap, uh, a genuine interest in health and fitness, qualifications, time, uh, empathy, sympathy, emotional intelligence, control of a situation, a willingness to learn and consistency. But if I've not got availability, it counts for nothing. Okay, you need to be available for your client. You need to be available for your staff. You need to be available uh, to for yourself. Yeah, there's no point having a, a star striker in football if he's always injured and can't work. The best ability is, ab is availability, okay? Um, and so, you, you know, if you're, if you're available, okay, in the right way, you know, you've booked an appointment with a client, you've booked a consultation with a client, you've told them you're gonna be here X, Y, Z at a certain time, and you're available, that client can trust you. They can actually, um, they can trust you, and you've built their, you've built up a trust with them. On a certain day, you may give them, they may plan out a session or do a session ad hoc, okay? And it not be the best one that you've done, yeah? And the client um, may recognize that and it's up to you and the client to actually say, you know what, let's up it. Let's switch to a different type of program. Let's train harder, easier, let's rein it back in. Let's concentrate on flexibility, mobility. Those things are all negotiable. Those things can all be, um, you can adapt to those quickly. Um, and uh, but if you've got all those ideas and you've got all number one to number nine, okay, but you're not available, it counts for nothing. It, you know, it's almost like you don't exist. In which case, someone else will do what you do, and they, hey, and they may even do it better. They may, worst case scenario, they may do a poor job of it. You could have very, very good uh, anatomy and physiology um, uh, qualifications and understanding. But if you're not available, it doesn't matter. All you've got is your exam results and your, your paperwork and your course sheets. No one cares, actually. No one cares about your certificates or your exams if you're not available, yeah? Um, you can tell a client that you've passed every module in every uh, qualification there is. And if they say, oh, okay, can I come and see you then, John? Can I come and see you then, Jill? That's John and Jill, the trainers. And you say, no, you can't, I'm not available. Oh, okay, can I come and see you tomorrow then? I'd like to learn from you. I'll pay whatever your hourly rate is. I'm not available. So that means nothing to a potential client then, or an existing client. So availability. So there are the 10 things we need um, as a personal trainer. Uh, and what you, and if for those of you that are thinking to yourself, well, there's another 10 things, I'm gonna put those in another video, okay? And that could be um, a, a premises, um, you know, equipment, um, software, booking systems, but they're, you don't 100% have to have those things. But as a trainer, you certainly have to have at least eight, if not nine, and ideally all 10 of the things I've just spoken about. All right, that's it, that's it for today. Um, the 10 things that I need or you need as a personal trainer. I'm gonna go through number 11 to 20 on another podcast, but for now, my name's Tristan Lowe and it's the Over 40s Fitness Podcast. We're fast approaching March, 2024. 
Uh, stay healthy, look after your friends and family, be nice to your work colleagues and your neighbours, and I'll see you on the next one. Thanks for watching and listening.